Thank you. <clears throat> so Martin, you have 20 minutes. <laughs> We're 15 minutes late, so probably five minutes. So before we start, can I ask everybody to stand up, please? Also, way in the back, please stand up. And the mic is on, right? Fantastic. OK, so before, we, uh, before I start my talk, I really like you to cheer really loudly for Amit Kapoor and this fantastic program Woo! until now. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, one more time, and now I want to see some hands. Yay! All right. Good. So competing for the future, and I'm stuck behind the desk, but that's okay. Uh, so competing for the future. Um, I decided to start off with the picture of the Taj Mahal because I thought it was fantastic. And uh, the last time I was here, um, we actually got an opportunity to travel there and uh, with some of my good friends. And what I found was that for... Um, it's really singing, right? Okay. So what I found was that uh, uh, in the three-hour travel all the way to, uh, to Accra, uh, I saw many, many, uh, many uh, people actually uh, watering the plants on the highway. And I was thinking, what the hell? Why don't we just put in irrigation, being a European and all? Uh, and that made me think about, hey, that's interesting. How do you use your resources? What's your price cost model? How's actually, uh, how do you compete in India? Because the drivers for competition are quite different in many aspects. So what I'd like to talk to you about today is, and this is going way too fast, is uh, uh, that first of all, competition has changed. We heard that today already, but um, we need new tools, new skills, and a new mindset. And I'll talk to you about this. Whether you're a startup, important for economic growth, or if you're a, 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 and it has a life of its own, uh, and, uh, uh, or a corporate. So why is this? Because what we see is that business as usual is dead. We tend to write long business plans, but I believe that business plans and long-term strategies are dead, are dead. So this is what I'm going to talk about to you. First of all, uh, I grew up in a, an entrepreneurial family. We had a big stock exchange listed company dealing with medicinal gases, uh, also in India. Uh, I did a lot of work with, uh, uh, with Mike Porter on value-based healthcare, and we actually set that up in Europe. And uh, as Amit said, we did a lot of work with uh, competitiveness uh, as well. So one time we ran into, we ran into Alex uh, Osterwalder, and Alex Osterwalder uh, uh, introduced us to the concept of uh, business model uh, innovation. Uh, and uh, we wanted to spread this message. So what better way to spread, spread this message than to also write a book, but by disrupting the publishing industry. So what did we do? We put up a website, Business Model Innovation Hub, and we thought, well, why don't we invite people to help us write the book? But furthermore, we're going to ask them to pay for it as well. So the first 100 people that joined actually paid $24 to actually contribute to the book that we were going to earn money on and not them. The second batch was actually 36, 54, uh, 81, and the last batch actually paid $233 to actually contribute to a book that they were actually intellectually committed to. We sold more than 1 million copies of this book in 30 languages, uh, so that's amazing, to all areas of the world. <laughs> but the most value out of this is in the value proposition design. And therefore, uh, in October, we're going to publish the next level uh, book. It's called the Value Proposition Design Book. And of course, it's available at Amazon. So far, it's self-promotion. So why is business modeling so popular? Because if you really think about it, uh, sometimes we're stuck in the past with the company. So I see dead companies. So be careful that you're not disrupted uh, before you can disrupt yourself. Because turbulence, and it was said before, turbulence is unforeseen. It's a constant in our world. You probably know uh, the, the, the VUCA world is where there's constant volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. So it's sometimes, for some of you, I believe, it's fun. But for others, it's like an amusement park. It's full of thrilling rides, uh, but not all of them are fun because the world has changed. Um, let's see, for instance, if you, if you were a hotel, 
you were okay by uh, having your guests over until we invented TripAdvisor and everything was commented before you actually went there. So you level service really had to man up to what you were promising your customers. In production, what changed? We built huge factories. And now we have institutions like TechShop where they have all 3D uh, uh, manufacturing uh, elements available to make your own stuff. In public transport, we used to had, had to stand beside the road to haul a taxi. Now we, have, now we have Uber. And Uber is fantastic. It's high quality, on demand, both from a sell side and a buy side. Ownership's changing. We don't buy expensive cars anymore. We decide to use it when we can. In retail, we know what's different from shopping to Amazon, also in India, very big Amazon. In music, I'm not buying CDs anymore. I'm buying a subscription to all the music there is on Spotify. So the rules of business really have changed, and this is something you really need to understand. But the single question, the single question that I can ask you is, in your business for now and in the future, where is value created? So we need new tools, new skills, and a new mindset. So imagine that you're in your boardroom and you have conversations on the future. So what kind of tools could you use to actually get a better conversation on, on your strategy and on how you're going to implement your strategy? It's the business model canvas. Some of you might have, uh, have the book actually, but the business model, uh, as, as it is described, is actually something that creates, delivers, and captures value for your company. And it starts off with identifying your customer segments. You really have to understand you really have to understand everything about your customer. Uh, and Clayton Christensen said it in his, one of his fantastic uh, books, what's the job that you need to get done for your customer? Dig into your customer needs, their pains, their, their willingness to gain their desires. So you can actually devise a value proposition. And from this value proposition, you can define the channel that you're going to use to actually deliver your product. The type of relationship you're going to have with your customer? Is it self-service? Is it subscription-based? Is it hugging your customer? What is it going to be? And how are you going to earn money? From a one-off, from a subscription? How are you going to deliver? What are your key resources? What are the activities you do? And do you need partners to do it with? And then finally, what is your cost structure? So this is the business model canvas that gives you a great oversight of what you, what you could do to devise a strategy that is actually coherent and future-proof. Let me give you a brief example. So besides the great marketing advertisement and branding from Nespresso, what do you believe made customers pay six to 10 times more for a cup of coffee than they did before? I mean, this is truly, you might have heard the example, but this is truly amazing that you pay six times more for the same product. Why? Well, let's, let's walk you through the, uh, uh, the business model canvas application. So the value proposition is outstanding coffee. So who are we going to provide it to? Home users, business use. How are we going to deliver it? Proprietary channels, only through ordering, so only through uh, the internet and some shops that were built on later. So not supermarkets, no nothing, just proprietary channels. They build a club. They build a club actually so that you need to become a member. Why? Because we could then collect all the data on your usage and develop new products. How did, we, how did they earn money? They earned money by actually uh, selling the cups, but also taking a cut of the Nespresso machines that were also proprietary for the cups. So the resources that they needed was manufacturing, marketing, branding, and running the club. The activities uh, and the building with partners of the machines. So the question was, are you then safe? Now you have this fantastic business model, which is all compliant and, and it's all coherent and it's reinforced itself. Are you safe? Well, there's things like patents and the patents run out, so you get a cost competitor. They compete on cost, so that's actually quite interesting. Uh, and not only you get a competitor that competes on cost, no, you get a competitor that actually wants to brand it even more luxurious. So what do you do? You also change the proposition. You actually extend it to, you extend it basically to uh, everything to do with lattes and macchiatos and also a proprietary machine. So it's the same model, different product. And then what they did, they actually also offered, offered a, a, a solution for babies where they actually innovated the product, they innovated the customer segment, they, in, they innovated 
uh, the, the partners that they work with, also from, from Nespresso. So that's actually quite interesting. So that looks quite easy, right? If I tell you this, you always all go, yes, it's uh, uh, ABC. But once you got to know this business model, how are you going to compete with this? And now here becomes a trick. To arrive and be off, we pay attention to our customers and offer the products and services most important to them. And it all begins with the world's most comprehensive global route network. United offers approximately 5,300 daily departures serving more than 360 airports. That's a different audio channel, I guess. Can we, can we do this video, please? The strong product market fit. Okay. Let me start over. Sorry, I mean. In addition to the traditional battle between new products, technologies, and services, let's analyze the four levels of business model strategy. The first level is what we call a level zero business model strategy. Companies that focus mainly on product, technology, and related services are at level zero. The best of them build great value propositions with a strong product market fit. The companies that compete mainly on better products and value propositions are often oblivious to the fact that they could outcompete others by combining their products with a better business model. Let's call this group the oblivious. Companies that just start to understand the importance of competing on business models usually perform no <coughs> business model strategies. They use the business model canvas to ask themselves which customers they're targeting, how they're reaching them, how they're acquiring them, how they are earning money from them, what resources, activities, and partners they need to do that, and what's the cost structure. Organizations at this level understand that they need to look at the entire business model and its components, but they use the business model canvas more like a checklist. Let's call these companies the beginners, who understand that products and technology are not enough. They've taken their first step towards competing on business models. Companies that know how to build outstanding business models perform level two business model strategies. They know that it's not enough to just cover all the components of a business model. Companies competing at this level have business models with a story in which every single piece of the business model reinforces the others and contributes to the story. A great example is the Nintendo Wii. Beyond the introduction of an innovative product in the game console market, they built a business model with lower costs more customers and superior profit margins. They outcompeted their competitors on the business model. An older example is Dell, which disrupted an entire PC market with its business model. Another excellent example is Nespresso. At the center of their business model is a machine that makes single portion espresso. But what gets customers to pay six to eight times more for coffee outperforms their competitors and produces insane profits is the configuration of their business model. These are true masters. But it gets even better. There are companies that compete on a level three business model strategy. They don't just compete on a superior business model, but they already think of new business models while they are successful. These organizations build new business models proactively before a crisis or an industry or technology change forces them to. Sometimes they even self-disrupt or cannibalize their existing business model while they're still successful. These companies are very, very hard to beat. They are practically unstoppable. Examples are Apple and Amazon. They continuously innovate their business model despite their success. These are companies you could call the invincible. So let me take you to one more experience. Uh, about this. Um, does anybody of you know these three guys, Brian, Joe, and Nathan? What do you think is their um, net worth, actually? Their evaluated net worth? Well, their net worth is $10 billion. So who are these guys? Well, they once were a startup, and now they're Airbnb, which I think is quite interesting. They didn't get there overnight, and you get the slide so you can read this. They didn't get there overnight, but they did disrupt the hospitality industry, because what they did, they built a fantastic business model with a website at the core of their business model. And what their business models look like is that 
they were targeting customers that were actually uh, pleasure travelers, they were business travelers, uh, who were uh, able to get a great temporary place to stay in a, in a foreign uh, city around the world. Um, it was all self-service. Um, the second customer they had was the renters, who actually rented out their, company, their, their, their homes. And what was their proposition? Rent your home or your second home uh, for an extra place to stay or an extra uh, uh, on the global platform. Also self-service, fantastic, no, no intermediaries. Um, so how was this delivered? A 24-7 service, Airbnb website, and word of mouth. They got a service fee from, from their customers and from their uh, 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 product deliverers, the renters, they got a percentage of booking. So what you see here already is a very interesting uh, profit and revenue model. Um, so what is it they did actually in terms of activities? They did marketing, product development, uh, and they were building a community. No product. So uh, what was their uh, resource? It was capital, brand, and community. They worked together with the photographers who made beautiful pictures of these homes. Uh, they worked together with the payment partners to actually settle all the payments. And what was their cost structure? Marketing, sales, and technology. So what you see here, this is a, a typical what you just saw in the video, a level three business model where everything is connected. Everything reinforces itself to make it really good. So if we want to use new tools, new skills, and a new mindset, we just discussed the business model uh, canvas as a new tool. But it doesn't stop there, because this morning we also talked about humans. How we, have we, so how can we actually get new skills? And how can we design new business models with new skills? I think in, in general we have an attitude, an, ad, an attitude toward uh, management and decision making, which is cool. So it's sometimes it's easy to come up with alternatives, but it's really hard to choose the right alternatives. And the question is, do we have the right alternatives? Or do we need to design new alternatives? But how do you design new alternatives? And that's really difficult because uh, we don't have enough skills to do this. Uh, I think uh, 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 Deborah mentioned it this morning very briefly, but of course I hear what I'd like to hear, and said, well, one of the future competences that we need is design. We need to design the future. We need to design strategies. But what some of the core elements of design is that you observe. So sometimes we're stuck in our assumptions so that we don't observe what we really see. And, uh, uh, and we don't test our assumptions. So we have to learn from our assumptions to actually make our uh, options uh, better. We also need to start thinking visually. Because drawing, in my opinion, is a new writing. So if you actually draw a picture of your business model, it's much better to communicate it to your audience. They uh, adapt it much easier, and it looks nice as well. And you need to prototype. So you, Frank Gehry, you know Frank Gehry, he prototypes everything. And then you have to tell the story. Because if you tell the story right, people believe you, and they want to follow you. And they want to implement what you thought of. And this is the f fundamental. So you need, from design thinking, you need observation, visual thinking, prototyping, and storytelling. So how do you use the business model? You can use it to redesign and invent as well. So you have to connect it to the vision, the strategy, uh, and the context that you have. So what we have uh, built for this is a process. And the process starts with understanding. Do you understand your current business model? And if I would ask each of you individually, you would say, yes, I know what my business model of my company is. But if I put you in the room with your colleagues and I ask you to draw out the business model of your company, then you get very different discussions on where actually, how you do it and where you see the emphasis of your business is. So this is a fundamental part of understanding where your winning ambition is in the context that's changing so fast. So if you want to start innovating, then you really need to create different innovation options. And these options you can only create if you understand where you're coming from, otherwise, you just have a me too process. And then the third step is, which we often forget, is we have to validate. Because how many of you have been on these uh, Imagineering trips, uh, great new product discovery areas, where we came up with great options and you or the CEO said, let's go, let's go do it. But we forgot to validate with our customers. And we got, forgot to validate it with uh, ourselves if we could actually do it before we started to implement it. So these are the minimum strategic conversations that you need to have. So if, I, like, if we think like a designer, how would it look like? And we, we do a process like this would look like such a, such a roadmap. 
for you, which is very attractive and appealing for people to, to have around. So, leaving you with this one question, where do you think value is created? Because the world is changing, we need new tools, new skills and new assumptions. Get rid of your assumptions, understand who, you're, understand who your customer is, understand what you have to offer and what they are willing to pay. And finally, trust the process. Because if you understand, innovate, validate and implement, then you'll be able to compete for a better future. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I was instructed 18 minutes, and it's exactly 18 minutes. I'm sorry. Thank you, Martin. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. We'll not go to questions here because we're running behind schedule. We'll, you quickly, you can have the questions at the last okay. break. So we'll move on to the next question.